I am very excited to hear from our keynote speaker today, Professor I. Nelson Rose. Professor Rose is an internationally known scholar, writer, and public speaker, and is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on gaming law, and I probably don't even have to tell you that. He's a Harvard Law School graduate, a distinguished senior professor at Whittier Law School, and a visiting professor at the University of Macau. Professor Rose is co-author of Internet Gaming Law and Gaming Law Cases and Materials. He is also co-editor-in-chief of the Gaming Law Review and Economics, and he's best known for his columns in landmark 1986 book, Gambling and the Law. He's testified as an expert witness and acted as a consultant to governments and industry, including tribes, major law firms, international corporations, states, provinces, and the federal government of Canada, Mexico, and the United States. His website is gamblinginthelaw.com, and it is just incredibly my pleasure to introduce Professor I. Nelson Rose. Thank you, Sarah. And I want to thank, start by thanking uh, Pete um, and Casino Enterprise Management, which is the home of my column, Gambling in the Law. Um, and is, actually, I think I have one due tomorrow, as I remember. Uh, yeah, it'll be a good one, though. Um, what I want to do is uh, take us back about 300, 400 years in, it, in history, bring it up to the present, and then go into the future to make some specific predictions about where we're going. And we're going to start by going um, back in time, because unless we know where we came from and why we got here, we're not going to be able to figure out how, why things are so strange in some respects, many respects, and also wh what's going to happen. We are in what I call the third wave of legal gambling. This is the third time in American history that gambling has spread everywhere. And twice before, it has come crashing down in complete prohibition, leaving legal debris on the, uh, uh, in the statute books. I'm, although I often act as a consultant and an expert witness, I am a professor of law, so I do like to step back and look at these big trends. Um, the first wave started even before there was a country. The colonies were funded by lotteries in France and in England. George Washington ran a lottery to build a road to Appalachia. Uh, in fact, it's said that it was more, it was easier to buy a lottery ticket in George Washington's time than it is to buy one now because they didn't have any infrastructure. If you wanted to sell your house, you basically had a raffle. Um, you couldn't, there weren't banks um, to go to. The problem was it all came crashing down in the 1820s and 30s, and the crash seems to be when you have two things concur. First, widespread scandal. And the scandals were that the people who were running these lotteries often didn't have the drawings. They just kept selling the tickets and telling the players, gee, we haven't sold enough tickets, and then they would run off with the funds. And players, you know, will play if the odds are horrible, but they want somebody to win. George Washington was honest. He did have his lottery and someone won. The other thing, though, that happens is there's a kind of a change in the morality of the country. And um, I trace this to 1820s and 30s when Andrew Jackson became president, and it was the era of the common man coming in, sweep out the old corrupt rich. And even though President Jackson was a big gambler, um, there still was this anti-gambling fever, particularly anti-lottery. So they actually wrote into the state constitutions that there shall never be another lottery. And that anti-lottery feeling went with the settlers when they went west. So if you look at the constitutions of Texas, Wisconsin, Wisconsin's got a great constitution. It said there shall, the legislature shall never authorize a lottery or grant a divorce. I don't know what was going on, but you know, they want to make sure of that. Uh, Nevada, Nevada still today says there shall never be a lottery, and California. The second wave started when 
the, uh, first of all, with the settling of the West, whenever you have a frontier, you're going to have gambling. Sometimes it's legal, sometimes it's simply tolerated. The South was devastated by the Civil War. It turned to lotteries as uh, an easy way to raise money. They had new constitutions which were imposed by the victorious North, so like Old Miss was funded by a lottery. But then again, we had the same problem. In the 1890s, there were great scandals. The, great, uh, the major one was the Louisiana lottery statute, I'm sorry, the Louisiana lottery called the Serpent, uh, which was selling tickets all over the United States. So states started passing laws. In New York today, there still is a statute that says it is illegal to sell a lottery ticket in New York, even if the lottery is legal where the drawing will take place. Uh, but they couldn't stop the Louisiana lottery, so they turned to the federal government and said, we, it's a legal product. The guys who were running the Louisiana lottery had bought the Louisiana legislature fair and square. You know, they paid them cash. This is Louisiana. Um, and uh, they turned to the federal government and passed laws saying you can't send a lottery ticket through the mail, you can't, and which eventually became you can't advertise it on radio. Those laws are still on the books. So if anybody here has a friend, for example, in Nevada, and you want to send them uh, a California lottery ticket through the mail, you are committing a federal misdemeanor. And the reason is we have to make sure the good people of Nevada don't hear about the evils of California gambling. Um, so the, the, the other thing they did is um, uh, it, it came to the point, all the states started closing down, all the lotteries were gone, the casinos started closing, everything got closed until by 1909, there were only three places left in the country with large commercial gambling, which were racetracks in New York, Maryland, and Kentucky. And in 1910, New York closed its racetracks. So we actually, uh, the territories of Arizona and New Mexico were told if they want to become states, they had to close their casinos. So we had prohibition. We all know about the prohibition on alcoholic beverages, but we had a prohibition on gambling in this country, same time, um, from 1909 to the Depression. 1931, Nevada even outlawed its casinos um, in 1909. 1931, Nevada re-legalizes casinos, racetracks start reopening, uh, bingo is discovered and played at first illegally and then legally by um, charities. The difference between the prohibition on alcoholic beverages and the prohibition on gambling was that when prohibition was repealed in the 1930s, that was done on the federal level and it said, okay, instantly all the states, first of all, it's all outlawed, then all the states can have the power to do what they want. With gambling, it's always a state issue. So it was outlawed state by state and when it's coming back, it's being done state by state. So I want to show you a very dramatic presentation of what the third wave of legal gambling looks like. I want to start with 1961 because that's when the Wire Act was passed. This is the main federal statute that is being used today against internet gambling. And the point of federal law is to help the states, not to impose some sort of federal morality on what the states do. So the law is designed to say, okay, what's the public policy of the states toward gambling? Well, the states in green are the ones that have no lottery. The states in red, of which there are zero, um, have a lottery. So this law was designed to help the public policy of the states, which was a policy of prohibition. We're there's no gambling and federal government will help it. And this is a law designed to go after organized crime. What happened was in 1963, New Hampshire rediscovered the state lottery. And it was designed so that they would not have to raise taxes. They figured they'd be getting all this money from their neighbors. It was a failure. New York was second. It was a failure. New Jersey was third. And New Jersey got it right. Where New Hampshire had the drawings twice a year, New Jersey said, 
Now, let's not make it twice a year and five dollars. Let's make it once a week, once a day, every five minutes, instant, one dollar. You don't have to fill out any forms. Notice that when you have a breakthrough, like Florida, which is a kind of a different southern state, um, is the only southern state, well, its neighbors now say, wow, they've got a lottery, they've got legal gambling, and Florida didn't break off and float out into the Atlantic and sink. And all that, hundreds of millions of dollars is going across the state line. So Louisiana, which is also an unusual southern state, was next, then Texas, and now, of course, we've got actually Georgia. I froze it at 1998 because it's an in interesting to see the political development of what happens with this spread of legal gambling. 1998 was a Republican sweep. All the uh, Republican incumbent governors were reelected except in two states, Alabama and South Carolina. In those states, the Democrats won, and what was interesting is, is the Democrats were running on platforms of let's bring in a state lottery for education. The Republicans said no, lotteries are immoral, and the Republican incumbent lost, and probably really significant, I mean they're both southern states, and South Carolina is the most Republican state in, in the nation. So we kind of know what's going to happen, right? The voters voted out. Uh, the Republican who was opposed to a state lottery, so then we're going to have a state lottery. Obviously, didn't happen. And this is an unusual event. In Alabama, they had a special election to bring in a state lottery, and it was defeated. The reason it was defeated, first of all, it was a special election. So the turnout was small, and a lot of people, particularly conservatives, um, will religious right-wingers basically will come out and vote, and it was rainy, um, where they're strongly against gambling. People, you don't have that many strongly in favor. But more importantly, there was an enormous amount of money poured in by next door state of Mississippi that um, the churches in the, all of the South were organized. They ran, they brought in thousands of people talking about all the evils of legal gambling funded by the casinos in Mississippi. So um, they, uh, uh, Alabama to this day does not have a state lottery. Now we get back on track. South Carolina, in fact, did vote it in the, um, and the legislature approved it. Tennessee, um, 2002, which is interesting because there were only three states left in the country that had no commercial gambling. Alaska, Hawaii, and Tennessee, now Tennessee has it, which brings us up to today. There's a couple things you should you, you recognize immediately from the map. First of all, there was a study done, the National Gambling Impact Study Commission, a federal study uh, 10 years ago, that recommended that there be a moratorium on no more, no new gambling in the, in the United States. First thing you notice from the map is, it's a little late. Second thing is, and the few states um, that don't have uh, gambling, I mean, don't have lottery, Mississippi, Alabama, for example, Georgia's very happy about that because all that money goes across the border. But look which states don't have a state lottery. Utah, what a surprise. Um, Nevada, Nevada actually had a proposal for a state lottery, but being Nevada, guess where you were going to have to go to buy state lottery tickets? You'd have to go into the casino, right. And even then, the Nevada casino said, ah, eh, let's not take a chance, okay. Um, but, and, and Mississippi, which is the third largest commercial casino state, um, they don't really want to have a state lottery e either. What, the other thing you'll see is, this is only lotteries. I didn't do, for example, Indian gaming, because you have to have a tribe. So there was no tribes in New Jersey, um, and every state could have a lottery. Every state also has racing, or had racing. And for half a century, they had a monopoly. So the impact on the existing forms of gambling has been tremendous. First, let's look, and in, I prepared a handout 
uh, which everybody has, and it goes into much more detail on this, but the factors behind this, this spread are important. You've got pressure for legalization that happens when you have a breakthrough. You have to have some form of gambling legalized either in the state or nearby. Usually it's racing, but it's also could be charity bingo. When that happens, first of all, it's now legal, so, it, so we've got at least the way to see whether it brings down society like the anti-say, um, but also you, you end up with the morality argument falling away. If the state itself is not only licensing gambling through racetracks, but promoting and selling gambling through the state lottery, and if the charities are running their own bingo games, how can it be immoral? Those are supposed to be the defenders of morality. California, we've got an interesting situation. By law, California has to spend at least, turns out it's about um, $80 million a year promoting its state lottery. We actually have another initiative that passed a few years ago. We have to spend about $40 million a year telling people not to smoke. So, California has, the state has gotten into the morality business. If morality isn't an issue, then all you have is cost-benefit analysis, and of course, legal gambling makes money, particularly when it's run as a monopoly. Uh, and the costs, the social costs, like if there is a, an increase in uh, compulsive gambling, that's hidden, it's harder to see. So, um, particularly during this time, gambling is seen as a painless tax, so every state, there are 46 states that are going to have budget deficits this year. Every state is looking at expanding gambling as, and of course getting more from tribes, for example, as a way to try to balance their, their budget. The other thing I am a big fan of, the power of incremental change. Just imagine telling somebody that there is a state in the United States which has casinos, widespread casinos, has a state lottery, um, there are tracks where you can bet on horse racing and dog racing. It has charity bingo, and the state itself take bets on sports events. Tell somebody during the Eisenhower era in the 1950s that there's a state that does this. By the way, does anybody know what this state is? It's, it can't be, it's not Nevada, because Nevada has no state lottery. It's Oregon. And although they're, they're eliminating their, uh, the state lottery bets on the NFL. So we've got to Oregon, you know, the center of hedonism of this country, um, that, uh, oh, and every liquor license has uh, video poker machines. This has been the impact on the existing forms of gambling. And this, in fact, makes it look better than it is. Uh, the racetracks in absolute dollars are managing to, you know, at least be level. But when you take inflation, this is from starting in 1974, when you start taking inflation into account, things are not too good. In fact, things are even worse than this. In the last 10 years before the Great Recession hit, racetracks lost 25% of their on-track business. And since then, things have been worse. This is on track. And you can see it's literally heading toward extinction. The only thing that is keeping racing alive, horse racing, in the United States is off-track betting. The industry likes to separate what they call inter-track, meaning you go to one racetrack and you bet on a race that's taking place in another from true off-track, where you go to an off-track betting parlor, um, could be a tribal casino, or at home by betting by phone or computer. But clearly, this is all off track because there's no race taking place in front of you. You're betting on a screen. So the horse racing industry is dying and is in desperate need for, uh, well, when they put in slot machines and turn, open up a racino, it turns out that it actually helps the track. Not only do they get more money, but they actually do get more patrons who go back and forth. Um, but it's still tremendously expensive. It takes so much land. Horses are so expensive. And it turns out, of all the paramutual industry in the United States, 
horse racing's in better shape than the others. This is dog racing. And this doesn't count the recent closure of all the dog tracks in Massachusetts. Uh, and in Iowa, where they have dog tracks, the um, Harris has offered to give a few million dollars and say close them. Um, see if you, by the way, if you can figure out when uh, Foxwoods opened up, because Connecticut was, uh, oh, this is dog, dog racing, wait, it's High Life. This is High Life. High, uh, Connecticut was one of the few states that allowed High Life, there is no High Life anymore in Connecticut. They've all turned into uh, racinos without any racing. Um, and High Life and dog racing doesn't have any off-track betting. In fact, we've come to the interesting situation, places like Florida, where um, high lie operators are asking for money from the government to stay open because otherwise they'd have to lay off a, a lot of people. I mean, think about that. Legal gambling, gambling is usually made legal to fund government. Here is legal gambling asking for money from the government. Um, the big factors, and I like to, to see, all right, what, what is happening here? If we go back 300 years, gambling was seen as a sin, which means you couldn't even talk about it in polite society. The, um, for example, there were no rule books. One of the reasons Edmund Hoyle became famous, people know according to Hoyle, Hoyle was the first one who wrote rules books about gambling in the 1700s um, because you simply didn't, it would be write, writing a book on how to operate a legal brothel in Nevada. There are no textbooks on prostitution. I have looked. Um, and there's some interesting legal questions. You know, are the working girls employees or, free, or um, independent contractors? They're independent contractors, by the way. Um, but about 300 years ago, uh, gambling shifted from being immoral and a sin you couldn't discuss to being seen as a vice, which means okay, we're going to put some restrictions on it. For example, we can't really advertise it or, well, sin you don't advertise at all. Vice you can advertise, but we're not going to put it where children can see it. And We'll put some other restrictions. This is still the overwhelming view of the law today. This is the reason, for example, in every state of the United States, gambling debts are not collectible, including in Nevada unless you have a specific statute or the, you have a judge who says, wait, things have now changed. So in Nevada, we have a statute that says the casino can sue the player if it's a written marker, and, um, but not for a, a verbal uh, credit. But if it's a written marker in a certain form, but a player still cannot sue a casino if the casino refuses to, play, to pay. Um, but there's a change that happened, and it was actually led by the state lotteries that said gambling is merely another form of entertainment. If that is true, it has tremendous implications for the law. Certainly you can advertise, certainly gambling debts um, should be collectible, contracts should be enforceable, and it turns out if you think about it, it should be um, available everywhere. So this is a danger for existing operations, particularly tribal operations, which are not in cities. Because if gambling is merely another form of, of entertainment, then let's put video lottery terminals in every grocery store. Why not, right? Let's have everything everywhere. Um, the view, the reason we have some of the strange things that we see around the United States is because the majority view today is still that gambling is a vice. It's changing, but that's clearly the overwhelming view. And probably the best example is when states started legalizing casinos, they either put them in the middle of the desert, like Las Vegas, or put it on a mountaintop, like Colorado, South Dakota, or put it on water on a boat and surround it by holy water to sanitize it, right? Um, but we're seeing more and more gambling of convenience spreading. The other thing that has happened, now every industry goes through this. You start with something being invented, the automobile, the computer, entrepreneurs, small operators uh, get into it, and eventually you end up with consolidation. Clearly that's happening with the casino industry where 
three companies now own 60% of all the casinos on the Las Vegas Strip. But the thing that seems unique about legal gambling is at some point it begins to get noticed. So the Congress votes in a commission to study the impact of gambling. It was really done as by the antis, but members of Congress said, you know, there is a lot of gambling. We ought to do a serious commission. They didn't, but, but they said, all right, we ought to study it. Um, and it starts to become an issue. It's still, we're still clearly in the spreading stages. Every time there's been a proposal to outlaw gambling, it, um, it is defeated. But we're seeing more and more anti-gambling fever rise. The other thing that happens is, at least this has been the progression in the last 100 years. Tracks opened up in the 1930s, had a monopoly. Charity bingo came in, then the lotteries, and then casinos. But it seems that the slower and low stake games with less skill get wiped out by the faster one. The perfect game seems to be something along the lines of video poker with a progressive jackpot, where it's fast, there's at least the illusion of player control, player participation, with the possibility of large, if not life-changing prizes. This isn't universally true. Uh, Massachusetts still is doing terrific with its paper scratcher lottery tickets, although some paper scratcher lottery tickets have million dollar prizes now. Um, but it seems this is, this is the trend, that we're going to see more and more machines, less and less um, skill, and obviously there's, there's some flukes in here like poker, which took off so tremendously. Um, but the wild card, which makes this so unpredictable, is technology, because we don't know what impact this is going to have. Uh, Daniel Borstein, who um, was the librarian emeritus of the United States, wrote a book called Cleopatra's Nose. It's an old saying that says, if Cleopatra's nose had been an inch smaller, all history would be changed. I think because, uh, who was it, Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony fought over her and she, if she had a different size nose, they wouldn't have liked her. I don't think, who knows. But it's basically, it's, it's today we would call this, um, uh, this is the idea that of, of a butterfly flapping in China, we get a storm in the United States. So what his theory is that there's a new kingdom. Besides the animal and mineral kingdom, there's a mechanical kingdom with its own rules. And I decided we should test, the way, best way to test is see if this is true. For example, he uses radio to say powerful inventions spread everywhere. The most powerful inventions for legal gambling are the monitor and the computer. So if this is true, we would see computerized gambling everywhere, for example, on bingo. Obviously, that has happened. The most popular game is video poker. Did anybody want to play video poker before it was invented? You can't keep it out. This is obviously important for the internet. And the technicalities, nobody cares. Players don't care if you call it video pull tab, video bingo. If it plays like a slot machine and it's a good game, they will play it. We, those of us who are involved in the law, need to know the technicalities. Players don't want to know and they don't care about it. You can't stop it, which is obviously extremely important for the internet. For the law, we have all sorts of problems. The laws on lotteries, are now, do they apply to video lottery terminals? Um, do the laws on casinos and sports books apply to the internet? And of course, the internet itself, which makes lines, well, uh, boundaries between countries look like merely lines on a map. And then, of course, there's the problem that the people who are inventing this, these machines don't actually know how to play the games. So they come up with just the craziest ideas you could think of. Um, I brought as a couple of examples, some of you may remember this, um, this game on, uh, everybody knows a regular pull tab, right? Paper pull tab. Turn it over. Well, this invention was the idea that you would take 
uh, called tab force, you would take a big pull tab. People would buy the pull tab, open it, and it comes with a barcode, and you put it into the machine, and therefore it could be read. And if this isn't clear enough as to what it is, it was approved by the NIGC. Let's put a handle on it in three reels. And uh, the NIG said, hey, it's a class two machine. It clearly is not a slot machine, right? You can't put money in. You can't get money out. It is a pull tab reading device. Now, the Attorney General of California said, no, it's a slot machine. This is its brain. Um, but um, I always thought this was the, what the, one of the early ingenious ways of entrepreneurs pushing the limit. Then, of course, you do end up with inventors going crazy. If you, this, you can't exercise unless you gamble. You can't gamble unless you exercise. If you don't like the treadmill, there's the sit-down rowing model. Um, this actually did get some sales on ships because it was nice. They could put their casino and their health club in the same room. Um, California isn't, uh, if you go out to the casino, they're playing craps where they have to use cards because dice are not allowed in California. But California is not the only state that has that type of a problem. Lots of, lots of laws, isolated laws, say, okay, you can only have table games or you can only have slot machines. So what is this? Is this a table game? It's an automated roulette wheel. There's no human player, so maybe it's a slot machine. Turns out there is a correct answer on whether this is a table game or a slot machine. Are there, how many lawyers are in the room? Okay, the, for the lawyers, you know the correct answer. Is this a slot machine or is this a table game? The answer is, well, what do you want it to be? Then we get to a little more interesting, a holographic blackjack dealer, and some of these now have gotten really great. There's a version that has a camera behind it so you can see the casino, and it really looks like there's a human being there. Again, is this a table game or is this a slot machine? And if we can separate the holographic dealer, the, the, the dealer from the player by a few feet, how about separating by a few hundred feet? Let's put it into the hotel room. Um, I did play uh, on a cruise ship. I played on the video screen that was in my room. So far, we haven't seen them in hotels, but we are seeing this idea of distance. And obviously, if you can be a few hundred feet, you could be a few hundred miles, perhaps. And this gets us into the question on whether the internet is legal. But why do we care? There's a big fight going on about internet gambling. Um, and just to tell you the number one issue, why do, why do people even care about like foreign internet gambling? My favorite cartoon uh, explains it because on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Who are those people? I mean, think about the internet as a wonderful idea, except for the fact that you call, you, you connect on the internet, you send your credit card to somebody using an alias who says, okay, I'm gonna bet against you. Oh, you lost. Um, it's just, it's amazing. Um, I want to bring this to where we are today. I was a uh, visiting scholar at the University of Nevada, Reno, and they have a map department, and I, with a research assistant, I found every piece of federally recognized Indian land in California and made a map. Now, it's a little outdated, but it gives you a good idea. It shows you why Nevada is so concerned about Indian gaming and also why Indian gaming has to be concerned about gambling being legalized in cities. California's major population is on the coast. That's where our cities are. There are no tribes in Los Angeles County or Orange County. In fact, there's no, except for San Diego County, you really don't have much. Uh, there's the Santa Inez near Santa Barbara. But notice it cuts off, here's Las Vegas, Here's Reno, which is even in worse shape. Um, they're obviously tremendously concerned, and they've been hit uh, by the tribes cutting off the flow of population from the coast for that long drive uh, inland. One of the things we heard yesterday was that uh, geography and demographics is destiny. 
I think that is absolutely true. California, these are the, the estimates, the census results obviously aren't in yet, but these are the most current estimates. California has 38 million people. I still remember when, it, when New York was bigger. Of course, I was three at the time. But California has many more people than Canada. It also has well more than 10 times the population of Nevada, which is why Nevada depends so heavily on California tourists. It, in fact, we can actually get the money. These are the most current years. And everything is down 10%, at least, from the year before. But this is how much is actually reported by the operators where um, the, except, with the one exception, interestingly, is the biggest racino in the country actually grew in New York. But all of the other uh, gambling centers fell. And notice, last year, all Nevada casinos total made $10 billion. We don't know the tribes because they don't report it, but it's at least $8 billion, although it also fell um, for the most part. And I will end, I, wanna, I wanted to leave time for questions. I'm going to end with an image. This is from 1996, and it shows you how much gambling has been incorporated into American culture. We have, they decided to do a special issue on people who had become millionaires, actually make more than a million dollars a year, outside of normal corporate business. So we have a chef and a poet. Um, but two of them are in the legal gambling field. We had a professional poker player who at that time was making $1.4 million a year and the chairman of the Mashantucket Pequots, which have Foxwoods. It's interesting in this long article on people who are making over a million dollars a year outside of corporate America and the fact that they had two of the four had made their money on legal gambling they never mention legal gambling. It is such a normal part of the society that it's simply accepted that, okay, there are people who are doing this and there's no reason to say, gee, this is really something, uh, for example, that we can be concerned about. So um, definitely the spread is continuing. We're nowhere near the crackdown stage. This, in fact, is the golden age of legal gambling. Uh, I want to congratulate all of you for being part of it. Um, just remember, golden ages are followed by tin ages. So we've probably got 30 or 40 years, but uh, now is the time to enjoy it. So thank you. Um, what I want to do, first, before I, forgot, before I forget, I do a mailing on, I write a column called Gambling and the Law. If you're not on my mailing list, um, send me an email, and I've got the... Oh, let me do it. There it is. Uh, rose at SprintMail.com, my website, which I'm redoing right now, GamblingInTheLaw.com. Send me an email. just says add to the mailing list. The other thing is I am the co-editor-in-chief of the Gaming Law Review and Economics. I would, we're always looking for contributors. It's anybody who wants to write on anything on law or economics. You don't have to put in footnotes. We, get, we turn them out really fast. And it's actually, it's quite a nice journal. Um, with things that are going on. And we do need more on Indian gaming, in fact, um, on what's going on. So what I want to do is thank you again, and then we've got time for questions. This is good. OK, great. So um, any questions? And, and I know you must be aware that there is a, uh, an argument, if you will, in California regarding the game of roulette and whether, and not the card game, yeah. but the electoral or computer facsimiles, uh, uh, there's one state opinion that says no roulette you right. know, is, is allowed. So can, can you, in fact, I had made a note to ask you in your spare time to give me a legal definition of what roulette is. But, ah. uh, well, a, a good question. The, the question was, you know, what about that electronic roulette and can it be done in California? The um, Harlan Goodson, actually, um, I, I, when he was the director, I had him come down and address. I, did a, I teach a class in gaming law. And um, he asked me along the same lines a few years ago and thought it 
well, gee, does this have to do with like the odds or things like that? And I said, remember the history. What happened was uh, the tribes got the money together and did Prop 5, which was a statute. And what they tried to do, what they thought they had to do, California State Constitution says no casinos of the type that exist in Nevada or New Jersey. So the tribes put together an initiative to create a statute that said, we are going to have lotteries. And the lottery will be lottery machines, lottery blackjack with a player's pool. Um, and Ian, what I have to say is the best decision ever by a state Supreme Court, the Supreme Court knocked it down. Not because of the decision, but because they cited my book all over the place. And when you get cited, it's wonderful. So they said, no, no. Look at Nelson Rose, Gambling and the Law, you know, 1986. Here is what a casino has. It's got banking card games and, and slot machines and other banking games. Um, then the tribe said, oh, well, we've got a problem with the state constitution, so let's amend the state constitution. And they uh, cut a deal with Gray Davis and the, and the unions and came up with 1A and got it on the ballot. The opponents who were the Las Vegas casinos gave up. Um, but they still, the whole fight was a hundred million dollar fight um, on, on advertising. That's how much they spent on the political campaigns. But what the tribes did when they got 1A passed in the Constitution, they thought they couldn't sell casinos. So they said, we are going to have banking card games and slot machines. We will not be casinos because we won't have craps and roulette. So it was purely a political move that is now written into the California State Constitution. So there's absolutely nothing logical about it, except it can't be, it was designed uh, to say we're not going to have casinos. And of course, we still have the prohibition that they can't have casinos of the type that exist in uh, Nevada and Las Vegas, except card games, banking card games, and slot machines. So what it really means is it's got to be a slot machine. I think if it is 100% electromechanical that it would be a slot machine because the game of particularly knowing the history, it's not roulette as it was being played in Nevada and New Jersey with a human and, and a ball. Well, it, it gets us a little more, I guess, complicated. The, the compacts don't, don't just say slot machines. They allow for right. electromechanical, computerized facsimiles of a game of chance. So, you know, to me, that's a facsimile of a game of chance. Right. It's not the game of roulette. Well, well you've got, you, there is, there's three levels of the law. You've got to start with the U.S. Cons I mean, sorry, the California State Constitution, which, by the way, is also an issue on Internet poker, whether Internet poker turns somebody's home computer into a, a slot machine or, you know, mecha uh, mechanical gaming device. It's possible you've got to start with the state constitution. There also was a statute, and there also is the compact. But the compact and the statute can't go beyond the state constitution, which means, let's say you have in your compact that it says, we can play uh, craps with dice. Well, you, it doesn't matter what your compact says. That violates the state constitution. So I would think it goes back to, yes, we do want to know what the intent was when they were making the compact. Um, what games were out there at the time, what was being played, and we know there was electronic um, uh, roulette was, was prevalent everywhere. Um, but I still think you would go back, more important than the intent on the compact and the statute is what was the state constitution. And by the way, this same fight is going on. I did a column um, a couple years ago. Uh, I teach every June at the University of Macau in China and they have a G2E Asia is the same time. I timed it on purpose. And I did a, a column called The Casino of the Future because it turns out there's lots of jurisdictions around the world. Um, Vietnam, Cambodia, I've seen them there. 
um, where they're not allowed to have human dealers. They're only allowed to have slot machines and uh, automated roulette wheels are very popular around the world because they're pretty universally seen as slot machines. As long as, now that's even, there's even a version that has a real ball and a camera focused on it, but still 100% mechanical. Thank you. Uh, my question is actually two, because I'm yeah. going to monopolize a little bit. First, I'm curious about what your uh, perspective is in regards to New York with the Shinnecocks and as well as the Aqueduct, Aqueduct uh, recent uh, rebidding of the, of the license there. And uh, second is I'm curious about your opinion on the impact of the Wells Fargo v. Lac de Flambeau decision. Okay. Uh, the first one was there's, there's a tribe that was just recognized on Long Island as being a federally recognized tribe. And I, I think the most significant thing about that is it shows we are not in the George Bush era anymore because uh, the last Secretary of Interior was opposed to Indian gaming and would even change the rules. The best example is... Um, the one in the other one in New York that got the approval of everyone and all of a sudden the Department of Interior comes out with a new rule it's not even a rule they didn't ask for comment from the public they said oh you want new land it has to be in commuting distance of your players I mean it was designed to prevent the expansion the Obama administration will start recognizing tribes again uh, they will allow I don't think they'll overturn that, but they'll start allowing more um, expansion of tribes for um, basically some off-reservation uh, after acquired land where, where you can get, if you get the political support of everybody. It's got to be everybody. Um, and so I think that's the most significant thing about that, is here is a tribe that, that one of the, uh, Obama was president for only a few months, and they've now recognized a tribe. What land they're going to get, I don't know. I mean, that's all politics. Um, are they going to get closer? They're, they're way off on Long Island. And um, are they going to get close to New York City or not? That depends, again, to get new land, you have to get the approval of everybody, not just the governor. It's got to be all members of the legislature, all city and county officials, and, of course, any nearby tribe. Uh, the aqueduct rebidding was kind of a, Government, Governor Patterson has turned out to be a big disappointment to, a, appointment to a lot of people and really screwed it up. Uh, what happened is this is going to be the first racino in New York City. It's literally in Queens. And um, they, it was clearly given to a group of political insiders. It therefore, it therefore became a scandal, got taken away, it got rebid. And the amazing thing that I saw on that one was how really good companies like Penn National Gaming screwed up. And I don't know how they, they got great lawyers, they got lots of money, they got their, you know, I, they know what they're doing, and they didn't follow the rules on bidding. One of the things you have to do when you're bidding is you follow the rules exactly. So there were like six companies bidding to open up a racino in New York City Five of them didn't follow the rules to the letter, got instantly disqualified, and it ended up going to Genting, a, a company from Malaysia. And they're going to spend a billion dollars, and they're going to put in 5,000 slot machines, and they're going to build a casino in New York City. And it went to a Malaysian company because the American company screwed it up. Uh, and it'll be fantastically successful. It's a casino in, tech, in New York City. Um, then the question on um, tribal defaults. The uh, uh, Lac de Flambeau decision, the Wells Fargo. I have been approached, I often get uh, talked to really big investors, people who have a couple hundred million dollars invested in a single company because, you know, they run mutual funds. And two years ago, I was approached to look at some of these, and I said, you've got real worries. There's a lot more than just the question on whether they're management contracts. Let's say a, a, an Indian casino goes bankrupt. It's not clear the bankruptcy law even applies. Even if it applies, what, is a court going to put in uh, a, an executor to run 
to own an Indian casino? You can't do it. I mean, there's real, real problems for the investors. And I held off writing about it because I didn't want to scare the market. Um, and then there were, the scares started happening. Um, I think that, I think there are le real legal issues uh, and tribal lawyers are required to raise all the defenses that they can, which means in most cases, I think that the tribes literally don't have to pay back the loan. But having said that, the whole system would break down if that happened. So we all have to pretend that a tribal loan is like a regular loan, that a tribal bonds are just like regular bonds, and we have to pretend that if, it, if there's a default, it would go into bankruptcy court, and the bankruptcy court would work it out and everything. Um, I don't think anybody, uh, like I think it was very dangerous that um, Lac de Flambeau didn't pay back on that $40 million and really shook up the market. Um, and it was stupid for Wells Fargo to take it to court because any good lawyer would have said, you got real problems with this. Um, it could be, any good Indian gaming lawyer would say, this, is, this could be construed as a management contract and it wasn't uh, approved by the NIGC. So I think that for Indian gaming uh, bond market and lending market, Everybody should go through the formalities and get good gaming lawyers who know what they're doing and then pretend that it's all enforceable, even if maybe it won't be. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank you for inviting me. Thank Pete again and Casino Enterprise Management. Um, read my column, Gambling and the Law. And if anybody would like to be added to the mailing list, send me an email. Um, I've also got business cards here if you need that. Thank you again. Thanks a lot.